Um, but I am very techno technically challenged, as you can tell. I'll see if we get this. Is this working? Everybody hear me okay? Does that work? Okay. Had my daughter, Cheryl, from New York City on the phone helping us get through this. It, 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 sometimes it reminds me of that commercial. Have you seen the commercial where the two grandkids show up to see their grandparents and they walk up the steps and the first thing their grandparents do is the kids say, it's wonderful to see you. And they said, here's our computers, help us fix this mess. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes that's the way I feel. Um, I did a smart thing, we did a smart thing, this is my wife Suzette. Uh, we did a very smart thing when our kids were very young. We actually spent some serious money and got some pretty, what would have been sophisticated computer equipment at that time. That would have been almost, well, 30 years ago. And uh, my kids got really, really good on computers. So they're like cowboys. It scares me sometimes when they come. Is that working better? You can still hear me okay? They're like cowboys on a computer, and sometimes when they're helping me do stuff, it's like, oh, do that, don't touch it, and I just plow through. They're fearless, they don't care. Somehow they get to the other end, and there's no problem, and, and it about gives me a heart attack. Um, so, uh, let's see, as he said, I've been beekeeping, I started beekeeping in 1981. That's part of our story, and uh, we started in Oregon, and now we're in Lakemont, Georgia, which is just south of Franklin, North Carolina. If any of you know where that's at, that Highway 441 corner that goes north to south, south out of Franklin and north up into Cherokee, and 441 also goes through Sevierville and Pigeon Forge and all of that. I'm getting a lot of echo out of that thing, but um, hopefully it'll be okay. Um, and our location is just south of the border into Georgia. Uh, in the summertime, most of our bee I'd say half of our bee locations are actually in North Carolina between Dillard, Georgia, which is right on the border, and Franklin, North Carolina. And uh, it's a beautiful part of the world. We really like it there. Um, our story really begins uh, quite a bit earlier than that. Um, <clears throat> Davey asked me to tell my story, so that's exactly what you're going to get. Um, we were living in Alaska. We got married very young and moved to Alaska in the mid-70s when the pipeline was just being started. And uh, at that time, it was like a gold rush up there. Everybody was rushing to Alaska to make money, and we did the same thing. Although I didn't go because of money, I just wanted to go to Alaska. I was 21 and she was 19, and we left Northern California. I was born in California, and she was born in Connecticut, but she moved to California very young, and that's where we met. And uh, we left Northern California, um, in May of 1975 and ended up in Anchorage, Alaska. Two weeks later, we made it on $750. That's what we took out. We left California, $750. My parents were so beside themselves. They said, well, call us when you break it. Call us when you don't get there. That's what they said. I said, no, well, we made it. We made it with $20 left, believe it or not, in a 20-year-old pickup. And we spent six years there. And I we ended up getting a job in a hunting camp, being a uh, watchman over the winter time when everybody left. Everybody left the camp, and the closest person to her and I that winter for a while was 65 miles away. And the closest road was 85 miles away. We were really in, you know, what you see on the TV, you know, the remote Alaska, you know, that's what we did. And eventually went to work as a hunting guide in that area. Anyway, we had a lot of fun. And I uh, kind of grew up, I'd like to think, in Alaska. But that first winter there, uh, it got really boring, quiet, lonely. I don't know all those words you could use. And uh, this hunting camp had a cabin that was dedicated uh, kind of as a library. Uh, they collected writings and books and National Geographic, everything you could imagine, so people would have something to read when they were stuck there for the winter. And I got my hands on something that some of you might know or remember. It's called the Mother Earth Catalog. Are you familiar with that? Well, they, they dedicated a page and a half to uh, uh, beekeeping. You know, in this catalog, if you wanted to make your own windmill, you know, you could order there and get the book on how to do it. And, and you know, vegetable gardening and all this stuff. And they have a page and a half on beekeeping. And I was kind of uh, fascinated. And uh, they, uh, 
mail plane came uh, close enough to us that we could get to it. That was one thing we saw every week or two, the mail plane still came to this location. They had started the mail route in the 1930s when there was a gold rush in this area, and they never stopped the mail route. They still came. Even when there was people, nobody there, the plane would still stop. And so I mail ordered a book, and some of you might remember, it was called uh, How to Keep Bees and Sell Honey by Walter T. Kelly. It was actually first published in 1955. And I, it, I just, it caught my interest immediately. I read that book four or five times, and I just, I was so fascinated. I thought, this that really sounds like something I could do. So uh, a few weeks later, I mail ordered a few more books, like Hide in the Honey Bee, and ABCs and XYZs and a couple other books and um, because we had nothing to do but read in the winter um, I actually and I'm not sure I can say this about many people I read Hive and the Honeybee from one cover to the other now if anybody owns that book you can, you can agree with me that that's quite a, an undertaking anyway by the time I was done reading all those books I was convinced I wanted to be involved in commercial beekeeping for a living and I never even stuck my finger in a beehive and we lived in Alaska for several more years before we moved out. We moved, ended up down in Oregon. And I specifically uh, remember looking for a job with a beekeeper somewhere trying to get started. And we kind of spent a month or two traveling around the lower 48, you know, that's what we would call it in Alaska, looking for a job as a beekeeper and couldn't find it. And we landed in Southern Oregon with really no hopes in, in that direction. And we, we lived close to where my parents were, that's kind of what made us stop there. And uh, I took our last $400, she was quite patient, when I spent our last $400 on eight triple D colonies. And that was my beginning in beekeeping. And the man I bought them from was, a, you know, I told him my story, and he knew that I wanted to become, uh, you know, a commercial beekeeper, and he said, well, these three triple D colonies will give you everything you need to begin splitting. And he was right, but not in the same way I had envisioned. When I got those triple deep colonies home, they every single one of them was full of swarm cells. Some of them had already swarmed, and some of them were in the process of getting ready to swarm. And I read enough that I knew I could make a bunch of splits with swarm cells. And the man that had sold me those colonies had told me about another gentleman that lived about a half hour away that sold beekeeping equipment. And he sold smokers and bales and all that type of stuff. And he said, you can get everything you need over there. So when I got those colonies home and opened them up and figured out what I had on my hands, um, I knew I instantly that I needed a bunch of equipment to take advantage of this. So I went and visited this guy, Central Point, Oregon, went and paid him a visit. And his name was Delmer Smith. He was an old, I hesitate to say he was old because I'm almost his age now. So I always like to say this old man helped me get started, but I'm almost as old as he was. Um, anyway, I told him what I wanted to do, and he was a really simple guy. He didn't, he was very soft-spoken, simple-spoken, and didn't have a lot to say, and he always got right to the point. Uh, didn't tell jokes. If you told him a joke, he usually wouldn't even laugh. He was just kind of a monotone type of personality. And I learned eventually that he was just a wonderful person. That was just his demeanor. Anyway, I told him what I was in the middle of, and uh, he says, yeah, I know what you need. And then he uh, wandered off around his shop and started collecting things. I had this list that I hadn't even shown him yet of what I thought I needed. And he was piling stuff in the middle of the floor while I roamed around his shop and looked at his stuff. And he kept piling and piling and piling. And finally I said, I, I said, I can't afford this stuff. I really can't. I don't have this kind of money. Don't worry about it. And he kept on piling stuff up. It was just so bizarre. I never met this man before. He didn't know me and I didn't know him, okay? So he kept piling all this stuff up and then when he was all done, I just, uh, I said, I, I, I appreciate what you're doing here, but I said, I just can't afford all this stuff. And he said, don't worry about it. He said, you can pay me back in honey and beeswax later. Never met me before. And there was a pile of stuff that had a Volkswagen van at the time, and I brought home a mountain of equipment from that guy. And he explained what to do with it, with it all. Gave me some double screens. Some of you might have seen my videos on double screen boards. That's where I picked it up, right? Immediately from him. And new boxes and single boxes and all of this bottom boards and top boards. And by the time I was done and the dust all settled, I had 35 colonies with queens in it. 
and that was my first summer, and that's how I got started. Well, Delmer and I became really good friends. He really was a very good guy, and he kind of took me under my under his wing. He had had 2,000 colonies in his heyday and only had one helper in the Rogue Valley in southern Oregon, if you're familiar with Oregon at all. It's kind of a big valley, uh, not like the San Joaquin Valley, but big enough. And he was the one and only commercial beekeeper in that area, ran 2,000 colonies with one helper. <clears throat> he had started beekeeping very young. I remember he was born in 1911, and uh, he uh, told me he, at eight years old, he started keeping bees on the family farm. They had 50 colonies, and his dad would have him help him with the bees. And by the time he was a teenager, he was in charge of the bees. And by the time he left home, he started building his own commercial outfit way back, you know, late 20s, early 30s. And uh, so he really, really knew what he was doing. I'll get off topic just for a moment and tell you a fun little clip about Delmer and his beekeeping career. He told me in 1939, he uh, made a carload of honey and sold it to a packer in Los Angeles for four cents a pound, and he was absolutely tickled pink. And, I, and I, he said it took him and his helper two days to load the car, and I thought, this doesn't make sense. I said, you're driving to Los Angeles? He said, no, dummy. He says, a train car. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they moved lots of honey back then. They loaded a train car. And they loaded them in the 60, you might be old enough, the 60 pound 10 square can, remember those things? The older fellows might remember. Gasoline, all kinds of stuff came in those square tins. And they loaded that train car by hand, two people, took them two days with those 60 pound tins and they sent it off to Los Angeles. Anyway, off topic, but it's just a fun story. Four cents a pound, my goodness. And he was tickled to get it. He thought he'd never get that much money. So later that summer, Delmer got me a job with a commercial beekeeper about, so that was October, I guess, and he said, I can tell that you're really serious about this. He says, and he gave me the very simplest but most profound um, uh, information that I got during that phase, and he said, if you're going to be a commercial beekeeper, you need to work for a commercial beekeeper, beekeeper for a while. You know, it's the same concept, if you want to be a carpenter, how much quicker can you get good at it if you go to work for a journeyman carpenter, right? And he says, you need to work for a commercial beekeeper. So he got on the phone and found me a job with a guy that was nearby, and uh, the guy didn't ask what I knew, he just knew that Delmer was calling, and he said, yes, yeah, send him over, I'll give him a job. And that, uh, I went to work for him around the 1st of November, and I went to work in his wood shop. He had a custom wood shop building woodenware. And uh, about six to eight people could work in this shop at a time. And that's what he did in the winter. He built custom woodenware for beekeepers. And so when I arrived and he gave me the job, he didn't even know I was interested in beekeeping. He just needed somebody in his wood shop. Well, in short order, he learned, we got to be really good friends very quickly. And he knew I wanted to be a commercial beekeeper. So he took me under his wing. And Eventually, by January, I was working uh, in the bees, bees with him also. And between the two of those guys, I was on the fast track to commercial bee keeping. And I worked with them for three years, and in the first year, I was exposed to so much, it was absolutely incredible. I, I was overloaded with information and knowledge, but I didn't yet have the wisdom that comes with experience. That takes time, that really does. Uh, I once heard a saying by a kind of famous saint over in India that really made a lot of sense. He said, wisdom is not assimilated with the eyes, it's assimilated with the atoms. It is skill uh, acquired through experience. In other words, you know, to become a master of anything, it really becomes a part of you. You don't read it in a book. You have to experience it, and that's how you get good at something, and that's what he meant. And so after three years with Glenn, uh, I've been all over the country. <clears throat> I'm glad they had 2,200 colonies, and we started off in the San Joaquin Valley pollinating almonds, and then we moved back home where we lived, and we pollinated pears in, in Medford. Some of you have heard of Harry and David in Medford, possibly. They uh, sell fruit packs for Christmas and different time, any time of year, but really big at Christmas time. We pollinated pears for them, and then we moved the bees up to Washington State, pollinated cherries and apples, on the eastern side of the Cascades, 
most of the apples in Washington are on the eastern side of the Cascades, where it's a little drier and colder in the winter. It's too wet on the western side. The apples don't do that good where it rains that much. And then we would move on to North Dakota for honey production. I'd come back home and we'd start to cycle all over again. We'd go over the winter to bees in southern Oregon and take them to California in January, February. I did that with him for three years and uh, built up to about 300 colonies and had my own truck and my own forklift. And I not quite quit him at that time. We left on good terms. He said, anytime you need a job, come back. No problems. I just want to go out on my own. And that began my journey on my own. And had a two-ton truck and a forklift and pollinated almonds. The almonds were only eight hours away from where we lived. And uh, we'd come home and pollinate in Oregon and pollinated cranberries on the Oregon coast and, and cherries and lots of funny stuff that I can't even remember the name of in the Willamette Valley. I went to work with a seed company in the Willamette Valley. The Willamette Valley is a big valley in Oregon. That's where all the people were going when they went to Oregon back in the 1950s and so on. The Oregon Trail, that's, they were going to the Willamette Valley, very fertile place. A lot of seed crops are grown in the Willamette Valley. And that, that was the beginnings. And the first slide up on this is kind of interesting. Uh, what are we going to do here? Something has changed between here and there. Huh? It's not showing the whole picture. It's not showing the whole picture. Let's go backwards and see what the first picture is working well, but the next one's not. I'm really having technical difficulties. I apologize for this. Hmm. Well, there's enough there to get the idea. I hope the next pictures are good enough. I don't know what's wrong here. Reader, North Dakota, 1983. I was still working for Glenn. For old truck buffs, that's a 1958 Peterbilt right there with a 220 Cummings and a 4x4 transmission. Now, these, tra these truck drivers today don't know what that means, and they don't know, certainly don't know what it means to drive one. It's a main box, a four-speed main box, and another granny box, or what they don't call it. What they call it auxiliary box with uh, four more gears for splitting the original four. So you've got two transmissions. And when you learn to drive one of those, you're really a truck driver. The power, nothing. You remember in the 50s and 60s when truckers had big arms? Well, there was a reason for that. No power steering. I mean, when you turned that wheel, you were in a wrestling match. And those old trucks were a little different than the trucks that drive today. Anyway, we moved bees back and forth from uh, Washington and Oregon to North Dakota and back to California with two trucks, one of them being this one. You can see the bobcat in the background, a uh, bobcat with a, with a mask on it. In those days, for just two years, bobcat actually made a, uh, a, a bobcat forklift that was specifically manufactured for beekeepers. We call it the beekeeper special. You can't see it very well in this picture, but it had a caster wheel on the back where you could lift up the rear of the bobcat and it suddenly became a tricycle. And you could spin around really good on level ground. It really worked well. And that's me in the front just uh, uh, rolling up the nets. So that picture looks more normal. That's Montana in 1984 on the road between uh, Washington State and North Dakota. Lots and lots of traveling in those days. In the second year, or the first full season that I worked for Glenn, I worked for him as a full-time beekeeper and put 65,000 miles on his semi-truck. But in those days, I was in my 20s and I could really do that sort of thing. That type of work schedule today would put me in the hospital, I'm sure it really would. But in, in those days, I could you know, sleep two hours at night and drive the rest of the way and work bees the next day and I could do that kind of stuff. This is a fun picture for me because that's my dad in the picture, who was not a beekeeper, but Glenn had two trucks, and one guy quit him for a while, and my dad was an old experienced uh, truck driver. He agreed to work three weeks with me, moving bees back to North Dakota from Washington State. And it was really a, a change of positions for me because I was in charge. My dad was had to do what I said. <laughs> But he was, it all went cool. It was really a growing experience for us both. After that trip, we really became a little closer. We weren't all that close in the older days. This is Gold Hill, Oregon. This is my first truck, which was a 1965 Ford 
F650 with a 20 foot flat bed. And back in those days, I ran my bees with six way pallets. These days, I use four way pallets. Pollinators quite often put their bees six on a pallet because um, every time, like for instance, if you're in an almond orchard and you pick up two pallets of bees, if you've got six on a pallet, you just picked up a third pallet. And some of those rows in the big almond orchards are long, a quarter mile long, eighth mile long, and you know, bobcat only goes seven miles per hour. So every time you can pick up you know, four extra colonies, it's really a valuable thing. And uh, uh, as a honey producer, I prefer the four-way pallets because you can work all four pallets easily. But the six ways, the problem is obvious, that center pallet, but that center beehive can be kind of a challenge to work. But it was worth it because we were picking our bees up so much and moving them. You could get more on a truck, and uh, of course, like I said, every time you picked up a couple pallets, you were moving more bees. Same day, that's how I used it. In those days, uh, very few people used straps. In fact, it was only like 10 years ago that I finally switched to straps I was so used to ropes. The reason I actually eventually strip, uh, changed to straps is because the people I was hiring to help me didn't know how to truck tie a really good trucker's knot. There's a little bit of an art to that. Most people today don't know how to do that. In those days, everybody that drove a truck knew how to do it. So eventually I had to go to straps. And now that I, you know, it's all straps, I, I really appreciate it. They really are better than rope, but it took me a while to switch over. You can see on this truck I had dual, had, on that side of the truck there's three gas tanks, and one behind the cab, and in those days those uh, 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 F650s came with a gas tank right behind the seat. How dangerous is that? The gas tank is in the cab with you. And then the big tank there up front and a little one behind. Um, I, uh, and, and Glenn was the same way. We set up our trucks with enough fuel to go a very long distance because the idea is not to stop. But then if it's below 45 degrees, you can stop, but if it's above 45, you don't want to stop. The bees want to come out of the colonies, they go to the net, they want to come off the truck. And I could go a thousand miles with that truck without filling up. I could go to, I could go to Baker's, I could go to Los Angeles from Southern Oregon and a couple of times I did have to go to Bakersfield, which was like 650, 700 miles, and I never had to stop for fuel. Almond pollination in Madera, California. Madera is, uh, I guess it's mid-state. Uh, it's in the San Joaquin Valley, which is a huge valley, by the way. People who haven't driven the San Joaquin have no idea how big it is. It is a huge valley. Um, it's, a, it's a good 600 miles from the southern tip, which is just south of Bakersfield, to the north before you start climbing the mountains up towards Mount Shasta. And most of it is agriculture. And uh, I don't know what percentage of our produce comes out of the San Joaquin Valley, but it has to be a pretty big percentage of what we eat comes out of that area. And you can see six white pallets. You have to have your address. When you're going to California to pollinate, you have to have your name and address on your pallets. So the bee inspectors can call you at a moment's notice if they have to. And you do get inspected there. Uh, growers would quite often have pay inspectors to come and look at your colonies to make sure they were getting what they paid for. Back then we had to have an eight frame average. Uh, a colony had to be eight frames or more in order to get paid. And these days they like to see eight frames but because so many colonies are going to California Many growers will settle for six frames. Uh, six frames will pollinate, but uh, eight frames is so much better. Uh, a, a beehive uh, becomes, as a beehive doubles in strength, it becomes 2.5 times more efficient at everything they do honey collection, pollen collection, everything. And how fast they grow. So if somebody gets an eight frame rather than a six frame, they're getting a lot more uh, bang for their buck, so to speak. I never had a problem uh, back in those days. This was pre-mites, by the way. We didn't have tracheal mites yet. And I had no problem averaging 10, 12, even sometimes 14 times of bees. A little harder to do these days with all the issues that bees go through. That's almonds right there. There's mature trees on the right, and on the left, and left, uh, those are young trees. This was an interesting uh, place for me to pollinate for. This was a uh, 
an older Japanese gentleman. He was about 85 years old at this time, and he was 100% organic when nobody was doing organic. He was organic. Everything he did was organic, so I really, I really appreciated working for him. Um, he had an interesting story. Again, we're off topic a little bit, but this is very interesting. He uh, had, had this property when World War II started. And of course, he ended up having to go to get 1,120 acres, if I remember correctly. And he had to go to the camps like every Japanese person did. And when he came back, he could only get 670 acres back. I don't know the details why, but they would only allow him to have 670 acres of his original property back. And when I met him, he didn't seem to be bitter. He wasn't angry about it, but uh, he told me about it. And uh, he was—he spoke pretty good English. His wife didn't speak any English. Maybe she could. I don't know, but she never let on that she could. But she was—this was a typical, traditional Japanese couple. I mean, she walked 20 paces behind him, and he was the boss. But he didn't abuse it. This was a wonderful couple. This, uh, um, and, and I got a laugh about her. Um, whenever I came to the door of the house, um, she always had to entertain me somehow. Even if he wasn't home, if I got anywhere close to that front door, I had to be prepared to have tea and cookies because she dragged me in. I was going to have tea and cookies. See, she couldn't talk English, but I was going to have tea and cookies. That's all it was to it. So she was really cool. I really liked her, although I never could talk to her. This is many years later. Between the days in Oregon and the days in Georgia, there's a lot of ground there that we didn't, I didn't have a camera. So suddenly you see us go all the way up to 2013. This is a holding yard in South Georgia. These bees are staged and ready to go to Wisconsin that year. And uh, I used to take bees every winter uh, to, to Unadilla, Georgia. It says Unadilla there which is uh, down around Cordell. It's uh, about 45 minutes south of Macon off I-75. Puts you on the coastal plain, which changes everything. The weather's different. Uh, the flowers, all the plants are different. The season's obviously much earlier. I would go down there to have better overwintering and be able to start making splits much earlier. I don't do that now. I, the last time I went to South Georgia was about three years ago. And uh, because my business has uh, blossomed into so many different facets. I just, I don't have to do every little thing with the bees to make money. And we were just talking at dinner. I kind of appreciate not having to travel like I used to. I'm really kind of tired of that. And that that's, that's history for me. That's an earlier phase. And I'm glad of it. All of our bee yards are within 30 minutes of home now. I have 42 bee yards and they're all within a uh, half hour of home. Just the same place, just getting a low ready to uh, low. In those days, I was running a deep and a shallow because you could get four pallets on a semi truck. With double deeps, you can only get three. Of course, with singles, you can get five or six, depending on the trailer. But uh, it's not really kosher to send singles to California to pollinate with. So I got in the habit of sending uh, one and a half. And you'll see some singles in the picture. That's because they're going to Wisconsin. But the, 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 the idea behind the deep and the shallow is because of the trips to California. Uh, a deep and a shallow is, is enough. You can overwinter, they won't starve, it's big enough. My preferred brood nest is a double deep and always has been. Uh, we run a lot of singles. Anybody that watches our YouTube channel uh, will see us operating a lot of single story colonies. And there's pros to that. There's good points to singles and doubles and, and story and a half. Um, the reason I like double deeps is because they're more forgiving. They don't starve as easy, they don't swarm as easy, and then when we're making splits, splits in the spring, all the frames are the same. Now, the problem that I ran into eventually with the deep and the shallow is I sell a lot of nukes, and I like that because I'm constantly cycling frames automatically. When you sell nukes, you don't have to throw frames away because you're constantly cycling. It's not about selling old junk, it's just about it's like selling a good used car before it's junk, you know, really. Uh, the frames might be three years old or five years old or something, but they're not trash yet. And uh, but the, the, the shallow will always remain. And eventually the shallow turns into trash. It's old dark foam. And so that's why I like uh, double deeps and my second choice is singles. Everything is the same. Uh, same night, 
loading for Wisconsin. I have a Swinger 100, which is this uh, machine. Then I have a new Hummer V. That's some of you might be familiar with those machines. They, you'll see ads for them in the V catalogs. That's an old machine. It was factory rebuilt, but it was a 1979. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, beekeepers were desperate for something to load trucks with. And their first choice was a bobcat, like the one I showed earlier. But some guys picked up on these swingers. They didn't come as a forklift. They came with a bucket. They were, uh, you know, a, what do they call that? Articulated. Articulating, yes, thank you. Articulating machine. They'll twist this way, and they'll twist this way. And people took the bucket arms off and cut them off and then mounted a mast on it. And it makes a wonderful forklift. Of course, eventually, uh, Hummer B and all the rest picked up on doing it that way. Uh, Orange Groves in Arcadia, Florida. I went to uh, Florida a little bit, um, both for early splits, raising queens, and to make orange blossom and honey. That was just one of our yards there. This was a huge orange orchard. It was 42 square miles. Um, I actually got lost in it once or twice. At least I knew I was going east or west, so I uh, eventually figured my way where I was out of it, you know. And it was laid off out on a square grid, all the ditches and all the roads either went east and west or north and south, so I couldn't get terribly lost. Gators in the ditches in Florida, you know. This is just a fun picture. Uh, during that time, I learned that orange trees still have the fruit on them when they begin to blossom for the next year. So in that picture, you'll see both oranges that are going to be picked about two or three weeks later and the blossoms on the tree. Never knew that. Oops, back up. Arcadia, Florida, same, same time frame, same orange orchard, and this is a uh, semi-load of bees getting ready to be loaded. Um, they gave us notice, really, the orange, this is why I don't go to Florida and why I stopped going to Florida. It's a, it was an 11 and a half hour drive from my house to this orchard. And we were there when the orange trees were still in bloom, and they called and said, this was a Thursday evening, and they said, we're spraying on Monday. you got to get out. And we had to get all of our bees out in just two or three days. And after that experience, I decided I'd never go and do that again. It was really hard. And uh, I thought, I'm not going to the oranges anymore. Me and uh, Alberto loading that truck. Let me back up on that. Fun story here. Interesting story. These pictures all, all remind me of something. That's why they're here. We loaded this truck. It got dark. It was strapped down. We rolled the net up in such a way that it just covered the top so that lids wouldn't blow off the load. We were only going to Jasper, Florida, which wasn't that far. So we left the net. We didn't drape the net down the sides. The bees were coming out, it was, it was crazy, so many bees, and it was a hot night, and so we just netted the top of the load, strapped it down, I mean, this truck was ready to go, it was 11 o'clock, and we knocked on the driver's door and said, you okay, you're ready to go, and he rolled down the window and said, my truck won't start, since the battery's dead, I think the alternator's out. We had to, all, of the, we could, didn't know where the colonies came from on the truck, we could put them back in the same place, but they, it would have been a terrible mess, so we chose just to leave the trailer there, we, uh, he couldn't even air up his truck, so uh, we aired up his truck from another truck, unhooked him from the trailer and pulled him out, you know, in a way, and then the trailer sat there for the day, and then the next day they brought another truck back and got the, the load of bees. A kind of a crazy time. And on that same trip, I didn't realize something else. Uh, we had had those bees in that holding yard that you saw in a couple pictures ago, and some of them sat there for two days or three days, there was a major orange flow going on, and I didn't really realize how much weight they were gaining in just those couple of days. <clears throat> we loaded this truck, sent it down the road, and I was about, I, when I left in my smaller truck with the forklift, I was about 45 minutes behind this truck, and uh, there's some, some scales at Wildwood, Florida. We were coming down through there, and I had to go through the scales in my little truck, and in the dark in the distance, I could see it was a bee truck, and I said, Man, there's a bee truck stopped on the scale. I felt sorry for that person. And then as I got close, I realized, 
oh my God, this is my V truck on the top of the scale. And the scale master was outside the shack, standing next to the truck door, pointing and talking to the truck driver. I thought, man, this doesn't look good at all. So I got, there was two lanes, I got the green light and went around and came back through and, and parked. And by that time, the V truck had moved up and parked and the driver was walking back to the scale shack. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to stay here to see what happens here. There was two truck drivers. I knocked on the window and asked the other guy, I said, what's the problem? And he said, the scale master said, this truck's way overweight and it ain't going nowhere until you get some of the weight on it. Well, by now it was like two or three in the morning or something, you know. And I thought, oh my goodness. So I got on the phone and Alberta was behind me with his truck and forklift. And I was on the phone call, talking to him when I had a tap on the window. And I looked over, it was a scale master, and he motioned for me to roll the window down. I rolled the window down, he said, are you, are, are, is this your load of bees? And I said, yes, sir. I was so polite, I just you know, had to play the game. I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, you're 74, 50 pounds overweight. Now, any truckers know that's a lot. They don't, you're not going anywhere normally until that. But when you see trucks parked at the scales, that's what's going on. You can't move until you get the weight on and he said something very funny. He said, I have considered the ramifications of this truck staying here till daylight. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, if you promise to never do this again, and of course I was, yes sir, yes sir. He let me go with a $360 fine. Should have been like two or $3,000 for that kind of weight. And uh, I told him, I said, we're just going down to Jasper. We're not far, you know, and he said, you go on, you go ahead, and he says, I don't want to ever see this kind of situation again, and he let us go. So just, just think of the disaster that would have been if that truck would have sat there while we're on loading bees and the sun comes up. We, they would have had to shut the scale down, probably. So, anyway, that's a fun story, too. Uh, on loading in Jasper, this is actually a load of bees that was coming home from California. This is, uh, I think, two or three years later. Uh, just a typical load of bees. This is a friend of mine. Uh, this is Lloyd Sherwin from Michigan. He does a lot of trucking for me. Uh, I don't truck bees anymore, but he still hauls honey barrels of honey for me. And you can see the load, deep in the shallow, deep in the shallow. Uh, Jasper, Florida has good uh, gallberry grounds, good uh, gallberry woods, we call them. So that's what the bees were doing there. Loading for South Dakota just a couple years ago. That was the last time I loaded a semi to go out of state. I've loaded semis since that I, of bees that I was selling, but that was the last time I actually loaded my bees to go anywhere. And these are just fun pictures. We use the red lights because bees, bees can't see red. Some of you know that. If you're using white lights in a situation like that, you get covered up with bees and get all stung up. But the bees don't see red. They, they, excuse me, they see into the ultraviolet range, which we don't. And then when it goes down into the red and beyond, uh, we see well, but they don't see anything at all. I don't know what they see. I don't know if it shows up as black or I don't know, but they just don't see red. Double deeps. We leave that aisle down the middle between the pallets so air can go down through the load. The idea, and the driver is given these directions, it's 1,600 miles to South Dakota, and we just tell them, you know, you can stop in the night, but you've got to roll during the day and then try to time it so you get there the next night. And sometimes the trucks have to slow down or speed up to accomplish that. Quite often you'll see a beef truck on the interstate just doing 50 miles an hour because he has to time it so he gets there after the sun goes down. Those were good colonies. We made a lot of honey in South Dakota that year. Uh, that's the finished load. Um, it was a beautiful night. I remember that night the moon was full. We could see what we were doing. We could see where we were walking. You know, loading bees at night is a kind of a messy job if, you, if there's no moon and you're tripping over every little rock and stump. That was a beautiful night that night. And that's the same load in uh, South Dakota, um, getting ready to be unloaded. Sweet clover in the foreground there. That's the big crop in South Dakota, and North Dakota, all those plain states. And sweet clover is a biennial and doesn't hit every year. If the rain is right and everything works out right and they get a lot of snow, 
Uh, you can have a tremendous year in those states, and that's what happened that year. We had a tremendous year, and uh, this year was a severe drought. I talked to a friend of mine in North Dakota this year, and they averaged like 20 pounds. It was terrible. And it doesn't pay your fuel to go up there for that. So those were, we did good that year. All DRs look like that. You can see what's in the mix. There's quite a few deep supers in the mix there too. This is one of our yards in uh, North Georgia. I just threw it in because it's typical of what we're doing in either spring or fall. Um, you can see the paraffins, of course. Um, but I found that the key to a really uh, effective bear fence is to make that center wire a ground wire. So as the bear tries to go through the fence, he gets a ground and a clock. And I found that out quite by accident one day. I had a uh, bear fence and I had this little probe, you know, negative and positive, check the voltage. And I had a fence that I knew put out 7,000 volts, but on the, on the tester I was only getting 1,500, so something was wrong. And I tested and I looked and I checked all the insulators and uh, it took me about 10 minutes to figure out that there, I couldn't see anything wrong with the fence. So I figured I was going to change out the charger itself. The battery was good. And I don't know why, but just before I was about ready to tear the charger out of there, I put the, you know, the positive on the positive and I touched the ground rod with the probe and it went to 7,000 volts. And I thought, duh, it's dry. It hadn't rained for three or four weeks. And if that's the case with my probe, that's also the case with the bear. If you want to give him the full juice, he needs to hit the ground at the same time. Now, if the ground's wet, no problem. But if the ground's dry, he needs to be grounded somehow. Now, I guess you all have to have bear fences around here for the most part. Yeah. You all. Yeah. yeah. We're bear central, I'm convinced. I think the core of it all is right where we are. We have a bunch of yards, and I think there's only three or four that don't have fences. And they're right next to the highway, and I think the traffic noise keeps the bears back. And even then, it's a gamble, because I'll hear about, you know, a bear across the road just a half mile south of your bee yard, and kind of doing this. That's our shop. That's 441 right in the forefront there. That's two lanes of the four lanes. Um, we have, uh, and then the little building to the left is part of our facility. That's our wood shop where we uh, build equipment and repair trucks and do all of that sort of thing. The large building is a uh, 180 by 82 with a 16 foot lean to off of there. And then on the right side above the store, uh, the store's on the right as you can tell, um, we have a mezzanine, like an upper deck. And the total comes out to about 20,000 square feet. And then the little building to the left is a, is a 40 by 90. So we have a lot of square footage there. That was our crew two years ago, I guess. Renee's in the picture. Um, obviously, I can't do it without help. At the level we're at, you know, 2,000 colonies and all this honey packing and everything, it takes a pretty good crew. And anybody who's had a bunch of employees knows that's a different, that's another job all by itself. Running a, a crew of 20 people is quite interesting. We're really lucky right now. Right now, at this moment, we have the best bunch of people that we've had in our history. Nobody's fighting, nobody's mad at each other, everybody's showing up on time, for, well, mostly. <laughs> Usually, I should say. Uh, everything's good. So, uh, knock on wood, you know, I just, we'll see a month from now, I might be telling you a different story. Right now, we're in pretty good shape. The beekeeping crew is to the right, and everybody else is to the left. We have about five people that work full-time in the honey pouring room, and uh, we have two guys that work full-time in the warehouse, you know, where all our barrels of honey and everything is stored. And then we have four retail clerks that work full time. Suzette does invoicing and things like that. And I'm just kind of a general manager, but I don't really, I have to admit, I don't manage anything, any facet of our business as good as I could because I'm so fragmented. So I just kind of rely on these people to do their job and 
every once in a while I'll walk through and ask questions and see what they're up to and make sure they're not too far off path, you know. And for the most part, it goes pretty good. And we would do better, each department would be better if somebody was there to focus on it and manage it. We have a manager for the pouring room, she keeps that in pretty good shape. The retail tail girls kind of take care of themselves, but Suzette and I have found that if we're there, things go a little better because we can answer questions and technical stuff. And, and the warehouse guys do fair. I have no complaints all in all. I just threw this in because it's a fun picture. Um, this is what commercial beekeepers see a lot of. This is the sun coming up the next morning after we spend all night moving bees. You're going to be a commercial beekeeper, and a commercial migratory beekeeper is going to see the sun come up a lot. That's in South Georgia. And that's us. Uh, YouTube channel is on the bottom there. We have about 90 to maybe 100 videos by now. Some of them are good. Uh, some of them show aspects of our business that you don't see in this uh, slideshow. We have a couple that show our honey pouring rooms, and uh, it's pretty neat. I think if you ever watch the videos on the like the behind the scenes of Blue Ridge Honey Company, where it shows the pouring room and all that. I've watched all of them. You watched all of them. Yeah, some of them are better than others. Uh, we just put out a, uh, a pair of videos on apicard treatments and. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think we're doing okay with our YouTube videos. Two years ago, I started it as kind of a hobby, just like I was watching Ian Stepler. You know who that is? Somebody said, you need to watch this guy. He feeds just like we do. And so I clicked on that video and watched him. And up to that point, I tried writing articles a little bit. I wrote several articles for Bee Culture. And I watched his video and I thought, Doing videos looks a whole lot easier than trying to write articles for me. I'm not a natural born writer. And what got all of that started was Kim Flottam, who used to be the editor for Bee Culture magazine. Um, he had me up to Ohio to speak to a uh, honey packing symposium. And at the end of it all, he took all the speakers out to dinner. And I was sitting right across the table from him. We were having a nice conversation. And I said something to Kim that was a little bit of a insult, but he knew I didn't mean it that way. I said, one of the problems with your magazine is you don't have a lot of nuts and bolts in it. He knew exactly what I meant. And uh, he went quiet. The conversation went quiet for about 10 or 20 seconds, and I thought maybe I heard his feelings or insulted him. And then he leaned across the table, got real close to me, and looked at me in the eye and said, the problem is we don't have many people that are doing it, writing articles on how they do it. And that's all he said. And so I knew exact that night in the motel, I made up my mind to try to, uh, you know, do my part. And so I made up my mind to write a few articles for him. And they were good articles. My daughter, Cheryl, who you heard earlier, helped me with this. She's a copywriter in New York City, so she helped me with all the grammar and stuff like that. And the articles turned out pretty good. And then after writing a few articles, which were, took me a long time to do, I saw Ian Stepler's video and I thought, well, I could do that. So I thought I'd do a few videos and it just turned into this steady stream. We, we average a video every other week or so. Been doing it for two weeks, or two years, and I've got 90 to 100 videos, so there you go. Some of them would be interesting. Uh, they're not aimed at beginning beekeepers, but even beginning beekeepers can look at them and learn a lot. You're nodding your head. You're a new beekeeper. You said you've watched several of them. Oh, yeah. Very good. Yeah. So but I try to not go too high, too over the head of people. And uh, I try, I, I absolutely make an effort to never sound like it's my way or the no way, because I know better than that. Um, you know, every beekeeper has their own way of doing things, and they're all legit. You know, like somebody challenged me on my YouTube channel not long ago. I got a comment that said, I just watched a video by Kingman Reynolds that said, never feed while doing apo guard treatments. And now I've just watched your video saying, you feed all the time. He said, what is it? You know, you seem perplexed. And I came up with a very diplomatic answer. And I said, well, Kingman is probably relaying his information based on his experiences, and so am I. It's up to you now to take information from both of us and decide what's going to work best for you. And that's the truth. Every beekeeper does it different, 
and what, you're going to watch my videos, watch payments, watch ends, and you got to come up with your own.